Hey man, let's go to the folder and go to number eight. It's good to be saved. Hey man, good to see Miss Wanda this morning. Hey man. about it 
And one of the things I was praying for was that the Lord would open a door up through all this COVID stuff because it's so hard to do door knocking now. Uh, you know, even people I know and bang on their door, they're like, Ugh. you know. <laughs> so uh, it, it actually gives an outreach now. It's an outreach. Uh, Saturday night is next night. Next week on Saturday night, um, uh, I know our preview's coming down. I'm trying to get Dewey Stewart over there for their first night. I'd like to see them have a big crowd. Uh, they're just starting back. They haven't had church since February. So they're just starting back um, and see what God will do for them and us. Okay, with it. Uh, Miss Yvonne, she grew up there. So for this, for her, is kind of a big thing. Yeah, I got you know? married in that church. Yeah, she got married in that church. <laughs> she says she's been praying for it. Too. Amen. So it uh, can be a big thing for some people here. Yeah. Uh, other things, um, I guess uh, there's a, I'll announce it later, but there's also a men's retreat coming at the end of the month for uh, up in West JZ. There hasn't been any meetings other than what we had here this year, so we're going to have, uh, there's going to be a men's retreat up in Shazy at the end of the month. October? No, September. September. September is right two days from now. Uh, also, the first week of October, Kenny McDonald will be coming in. Um, I, Other than that, I have, uh, I don't know of anything else. And um, your parents come home when? Next year. Next year? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, they'll be in next year, and you know, I don't know how long they're coming for. They're coming for a while, aren't they? So, uh, you know, we'll have more. Um, hopefully, God will raise up a man. And I'm hoping that, you know, I, uh, God raised up Cody. Cody's now, uh, he's, he's struggling because he didn't have a trial yet. So right now he's struggling. And um, make sure you pray for him. Make sure you pray for him. And hopefully he'll be, I, I think he's going to be pastor of that church. Just going to take some time because he's young. You know, and he, he wants it now. He's got that zeal. But remember I told you about zeal. It can work both ways, you know. And uh, you got to watch your zeal. Because what zeal can do is zeal can look like also like you're trying to, to uh, uh, take over something. Power, of course. It's not the way you want to take it. The best way to get a ministry is when God turns around and says, here it is. Amen. And you can take it, you know. Um, other than that, uh, of course, we have the cookout this afternoon uh, here, uh, meal at the end. And uh, probably, uh, Rich is probably going to come in in the next uh, 25 minutes with the stuff. And uh, so don't be all panicky or anything like that. He's, he's normal. And uh, he'll just... He likes that grand entrance, you have to understand. He's army, he loves that grand entrance, so he's coming in and everything is going to be, in, uh, oh, I can't believe that, you know, up in the air. So, okay, we'll just take care of it, be calm. <laughs> Amen. Let's turn to the book of Joel. Last week we were in the first part of Joel. Joel is a writing prophet, if you... Uh, you don't see him much in the Bible. It's not like Isaiah where you see him a lot, where he was a, a preaching prophet. Uh, Joel is more or less a writing prophet. You don't hear much about the man. He, uh, he writes in Judah in the south. And he is the first one that really uh, brings in and his only subject is the day of the Lord. He is quoted by Peter. Peter quotes Joel which has been used as an immature uh, method of worship, false worship, which is, we know it as the charismatic movement, okay? And uh, they don't understand what they're actually doing because uh, Zephaniah would clear it up for anyone. Uh, go to, uh, actually, before we start, go to uh, Zephaniah chapter uh, 2. Zephaniah chapter 2. Zephaniah chapter 2. It's only a few uh, books to... Uh, to the right. Zephaniah chapter 2.
and in Zephaniah chapter chapter two, first um, uh, look down at um, verse number thirteen. And you'll notice it says, And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria. So we know that Assyria has been the problem in Joel. And he says this is what's going to happen later. He's going to stretch out his uh, hand against the north and destroy uh, Assyria. And, and will make Nineveh a desolation dry like a wilderness. Now, how's that happen? Okay. Uh, God called Nebuchadnezzar, what, a servant of his, right? He was using him to come in and punish uh, Judah at the time. Okay, uh, do you ever hear God say something like this? He'll call an evil man his servant, and, and it makes you think, "Oh, what's what he? He's a good guy." No, he's not. What God is doing is using evil to punish sin. He's using evil to punish sin. Well, anybody here ever read the book of Jonah? Yeah. Jonah goes. Jonah was supposed to go to what area? Nineveh. Nineveh in Assyria, okay, where the Assyrian is. And when he gets there, he's supposed to preach to him. And Jonah, people don't understand. They think Jonah just doesn't want to go like like his um, his travel plans were messed up a little or something, and he got disappointed. And he just doesn't want to go because the sites aren't very good in Nineveh. Well, that isn't the case. What it is is Jonah's not stupid. He's a prophet. He can see some things. You know what he sees? He sees that if Nineveh gets right with God, they're going to come and they're going to, to fight against Judah. It was pretty much there. So Jonah didn't want to do it for that reason. Okay? You have to realize he was not, he was, Jonah didn't, wasn't like, I don't want to know God anymore. Okay? He was, he knew the right God. He was still saved. Uh, he just was disobedient to what God was doing. And what, look, it's like this. If God come along and said, look, I'm calling you, Larry, to be the last of the, of my prophets, that you're going to be here until uh, the end. And then all of a sudden, uh, the Lord says, oh, uh, you realize, you say, hey, wait a second. I'm supposed to preach to these uh, to these people, and these people are going to rise up against. And so you'd be like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. He's going after the church. But you got to understand something. That's God's will. That's God's will. Uh Today, the will of God is that sooner or later, a, a man's coming along. It's happening. He's already in the. He's already in the world, people. You realize the man is already in the world. He's coming. He will be the Assyrian. He will be Judas. He will be that guy, and he will. Uh, he, he is ordained to take over. People who think they're going to stop him are crazy, because God ordained it. Amen. So. In the first chapter of Joel, going back to Joel, in the first chapter of Joel, in the very beginning, we went from uh, verses 1 to verse uh, 12 and 13. And um, Joel was trying to show them it was a famine that it came in, and it was about a plague. Uh, and it's funny how we're dealing with it right now. It's not really a plague what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a newspaper plague. But anyway, this is a real plague that they're dealing with. And um, and Joel uh, uh, Joel has to put in a, for this real plague of the famine that happened. And he said in verse number 4, he was trying to warn them. And he said, that which the palmer worm had left uh, the locust eaten, and that which the locust had left the canker worm eat, had eaten, and that which the canker worm had left, hath the caterpillar eat, eaten, and there's nothing good left. And really what he's trying to show you is the deterioration of, uh, of the land. And he wants you to understand spiritually that you have a deterioration too. There was a deterioration in a spiritual way back to them. What's that? The first thing they did was stop obeying the law and God's voice. They weren't hearing God's word anymore. There's a famine in the land, and it's back again today. And it's not a famine of, of food. It's not a famine of drink. It, it's a famine of hearing the word of God. Why? The preachers aren't preaching it no more. They took the book out of the church house, and now you've got church houses that are just uh, birthing. Now I'm saying the church houses are birthing fake Christians today. 
Christians that aren't saved just sitting in the church today. Why? They ain't got the right book, people. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. God. You don't think God's going to stick to that? Amen. He has. Amen. Uh, you got rid of the book. For the Jews, they got rid of the law. The next thing, the locust ate. What's that they left? What was left for them? Well, their great history was left. Just like us, our great things are left. And what happened? It, it gets eaten up. In the church house, they, the first thing they did was they got rid of the book. The next thing that happens is a deterioration. What's that? What's the next principle that we got rid of? Well, we got rid of our doctrine. You know what was keeping people out of the church house? They just didn't like it. So they got rid of the doctrine. And then the next thing they did was they got rid of the, the, the they got rid of the Jew. The Jews got rid of the uh, the writings. They got rid of uh, the Psalms. They got rid of the Song of Solomon. They got rid of those things. They they stopped listening to the writings that were out there that God had placed. And if we do the same thing, what we get rid of, we got. We got, we, we got rid of the doctrines, and then you know what we'd get rid of? We got rid of the music. The old traditional music we got rid of. And then, as uh, time went on, they started to bring in these other music that was like, you know, the bouncy ball music and seven words spoken 11 times. That's what they do today. They sing. You gotta, uh, you gotta look, listen to the songs. I, look, I have nothing wrong with spiritual songs. I have nothing wrong with songs about Jesus. But if you listen to them, they're very simple today. What's the best we got? His name is Jesus, the the, the Lion of Judah. I mean, Jesus, what a wonderful name! And I, I, it's a great song. But you have to understand the simplicity of it. It's not, uh, it's not like, it's not like blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste. When people were more spiritual, as you go back, the people were more spiritual then than they are today. They got rid of the music. They brought the drums in. And then the last is the caterpillar. What's that? Well, they got, for the Jews, they got rid of the prophets. They start killing them. They started, uh, they were assassinating their own preachers. Every time a preacher got up and said something they didn't like, next thing you know, he was in prison. Read your Bible. You know, that's why, did you ever notice that Jesus always says, did you never read? Did you never read? You're, you're, people, you're being too nice. You know what he's actually saying? What you get mad about when somebody says it like, don't you ever read your Bible? Right. Well, how dare you speak to me like that? What do you think they did? Mm -hmm. It was the king of kings that was saying it to them. The one that knew their hearts that would say, don't you read your Bible? It, you know, when somebody says that to me, you know what I say? Better start reading it. <laughs> Better start reading it. Well, I was, why get your back up in the air? You really know your Bible as much as you need to know it? Don't get your back up in the air. Do what? Just read your Bible. Amen. Don't you ever read. He said they, they got rid of the prophets. You know what they got rid of today? The last thing that's left in some of them. There's a guy there who's been there for years and he's been preaching and he preaches a good message. You know what they do? They get rid of him now. Next thing you know, they get rid of a guy out of the out of the out of the pulpit that preaches the word of God. You know what they bring in? They bring in some hippie who stands up there and he says things like Joel Osteen does. You're all good and you know, this is all good stuff and everybody you do good, God will do good things and you know, like it's some kind of deal going on. And, uh, and you just be nice, and things will happen that are nice. And uh, you're in church, and that's what God wants. He just wants you in church, and He wants you to be happy. God always wants you to be happy. That's the preaching is today. Be happy. I mean, man, do you understand that's, that's, that's barroom preaching? Just be happy. Have another drink, just be happy. That's barroom preaching. Amen. So what they have left after the caterpillar? No truth. They're drunk in the world and drunk with the world. And that's their play. So now we're going to be in, um, it says their vine is dried up. They got nothing good to offer. And then we'll start. Verse number 13, he says, he says, after saying that all to him, he says, gird yourselves and lament, you priest. 
Howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. For the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. He took away the, the joy's gone. The wine is, the, is a representation. The new wine is a representation of the joy. What he's trying to tell you is that now that everything's gone, all the good stuff is gone, guess what you got? You got dried up nothing. It, it's, like, uh, you're, it's like the kids today at 11 years old and they, they're sitting there and they want a cell phone more than anything. I'm not picking on cell phones, care less. What I'm saying is that's where their heart is for those things. And they, everything is a temporary, a temporary time of happiness. If happiness goes away, people, joy does go away. But let me tell you something, it's a lot better to have joy than happiness. Joy comes from the, out, from the inside out. Happiness starts from the outside and goes in. Okay? There's a lot of difference. Amen. So he says, uh, gird yourselves up and lament. It's going to take something to gird yourself up and lament. It's basically, usually he says, gird yourself up and stand like a man. Now, look at that one. It says, gird yourselves and lament. When have you ever heard that one? Uh, you know, my dad always said, only girls cry. He's looking at the men. He's saying, gird yourselves up. Be like a man and do what? And lament. That's a harder deal. Uh, you remember Mordecai in the book of Esther? Right. He found out, man, they're going to kill the Jews. they got to dot. they got to they got a decree over there. They're going to waste us away. They're going to have a genocide. And he, get, and he turns around, puts sackcloth, and he rents his clothes, and he goes out and he cries in the street. You know what he, he was gird up like a man. What's that? A man understands the circumstance that he's in. Gird yourself up like a man and lament. He tells it. Look who he puts it to. Look at verse 13. Look at that. He says, lament who? Ye priests. Now, who are the priests of today? We are. He told you what? He's saying, look, it's, it's everything's going away. Guess what? Gird yourself up and do what? Lament. Lament. It's going away. Why? Come on, priest. He says, how? How? Look how pertinent. How? Ye ministers of the altar. And look what he says, the next word. What is that? Come. You've got to understand, this is, this is pointed just like that. It, come. That means, look, it's like me going like this, Larry, come here. And he gets up. Okay? You don't have to get up. I'm just saying, I say, Larry, come here. And Larry comes, and where does he come? He comes up here. Now we're together, right? Now think of how God's saying that. Come, what's that? He's already there. His heart's already in a lamenting stage. God's already troubled by this, and he's saying, I want, I want to be, it. look, you have to understand something. He wants to be in the boat with you. Now do you get you? Gird yourself up. It's not about your work. It's about getting in with God. This is God's part. This is God's feeling. And he says, and I want you with me. I want you to be with me on this. He says, come, lie all night sackcloth, you ministers of my God. And why do you want to do this? For the meat offering and for the drink offering is withholden. Uh, from the house of your God. Now, if you remember back in Leviticus chapter 2, even in verse 1, it talked about these offerings. These offerings, the meat offering, what is it? It's a fellowship offering. It's a meat, a meal. What's that? It's your book. It's your Bible. It's your fellowship. The meat offering is a bread. What is the bread, the bread that you have? It's that Bible that's in front of you. It's bread. That's how the Bible looks at it. Uh, our bread is not as their bread. The showbread, the six, the six six showbread. What's that? Sixty six books of the showbread. And he says, for the meat offering, you got no Bible, and the drink you got no joy is withholden from the house of your God. Now the way they say that is the house of your God. It just didn't say the house of God, did it? It says the house of your God. What he's trying to say is it's personal to you and there's no joy in that house. 
Come, let's lament, so what? And get to praying and get to, get to seriousness to do what? Bring the joy back in. There's a time when joy can leave the house. Hey, look, uh, go through a church split. Watch the joy just go right out. It's going to be work to joy to do it. I, I know places place going through a church split, and they're still not over it. And it's been, could be six, ten years maybe. And they're still not over it, and the preacher's still talking about it. You know what? Sometimes they, you have to get down and cry and lament. Come to the house and lament, the Lord said. Uh, verse number uh, 14, the next section, he's going to give the remedy of it. And here's what you need to do. What's that? Sanctify ye a fast. Sanctify ye. Get serious. Call a solemn assembly. Did you notice he didn't say call a, a mountaintop experience? Hey, if you want to solve your problems, this is Christianity today. If you want to solve your problems, we'll have a meeting. We'll have a revival meeting. Hey, am I hitting a little truth there? Amen. Haven't you heard this? Let, hey, look, the church is in, in dire straits. You know what we need? We need a meeting. No, we don't need a meeting. We need to get serious with the Lord. What do you think? He's looking at that meeting. Maybe somebody might come from that meeting and have a zeal or something like that, but God's looking at the unit and saying it needs to be, it, it needs to start here. It needs to start here. Not, it doesn't need to start in like a Rochester. It doesn't need to start up in West Shady. It needs to start here. Right. That's where it needs to start. It says, call a solemn assembly. He didn't say a, 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 a um, uplifting assembly. Why? Solemn, I, I want it done orderly. Go to, uh, Go to Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23, the third book of the Bible. So it's in the beginning. See that word solemn? will catch you. You say, what does he mean? Well, you have to go where Solomon is. And look at verse number 36. He's uh, talking about the Feast of the Tabernacles, and he says, Seven days ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now watch this, on the eighth day. What's that? The new beginning. The new beginning. He says, On the eighth day shall, shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Now watch. It's a solemn assembly. What's that? The eighth day is a solemn assembly. It's a new beginning. It's a new beginning. I want a solemn assembly. I want things in order. And, and I don't want you to do any servile work thereon. I need a solemn assembly. What's that? I need seriousness, people. God's saying I need seriousness. I need you to be in meditation for this stuff. Uh, have you ever taken a, have a... Has a verse in the Bible ever stuck with you walking out the door and it's just there? And it just keeps going and it just keeps going and it's just there? And, and and you can't you ever had it where it can't get rid of it? Yeah. I've had that, a verse in my head. It just can't get rid of it. And it just stays there, stays there. And then finally something will happen and I'll that's it. That was it. Or something like that. Or it goes away. I've had that happen too. Okay? God's looking at a solemn assembly of, of a meditation thing. And uh, and he says, Gather who? Gather the elders. Right. You need we need a prayer night. We gather the elders, okay, uh, and all the inhabitants of the land. Into the, get them into the house of, of the Lord, your God, and do what? And cry. We need a prayer meeting. We need to call on the Lord. Isn't it funny? The Lord's telling you to come in, and then he says, I want you to do something. What's that? Pray to me. Well, you brought me here. We should have a good time. No, I want you to come in and have a solemn assembly. I want a prayer done. This is where it starts, people. If you look from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 4, what you'll find is prayer, 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 prayer. When they prayed, the house was shaken. I mean, when was the last time you got down and prayed and you were shaken afterwards? See, people think the house was shaken. They're thinking the house is going like this. 
No, he says the house was shaken. You've ever had your house shaken? Okay, let me make a tragedy. I'll come in and give and deliver you the news. Right. You getting it now? Yeah. The house was shaken. And uh, and and they were all in one. You know when uh, the book of Acts take, takes a turn? Chapter 5 is the first turn. What's that? They're not in all one accord after that. After that, they've had problems. That's the first problem that comes in is Acts chapter 5. Ananias and Sapphira, uh, church fakers. That's basically what happened, church fakers. Okay? So um, he says, cry unto the house of the Lord. Verse number 15 is the theme of the whole book. Here's the read. Alas! Alas for the day. For the day of the Lord is at hand. And as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. There's the theme of the whole book. Alas, the day of the Lord. This is why Peter used that this book in Acts chapter 2. Why? They were on the cusp of the day of the Lord coming. And Peter was explaining, if we can get this kingdom, Jesus wants to reign. Let's get our hearts over to him. But guess what? We've got to go through seven years. And that's what they didn't want to do. Even the believers. And the day of the Lord. You know what the day of the Lord is? It's a, it's a day of judgment. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment. And, uh, and it's coming. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, you, you actually use this verse. It says, uh, as it is appointed unto man, what? Wants to, die. Wants to die. And after this, what? The judgment. Do you realize the day, the day that you pass is your day of the Lord? And guess what? If you're unsaved, guess what the day of your death is? It's the day of the Lord for you. You're not going to be there when He comes back. Where are you going to be? You're not going to be in hell. Your day of the Lord is that day. Why? you got an appointment. The only thing you're going to be doing after that, everybody says, oh, we'll be in hell screaming. How do you know? I know they say these things. As you do. I, I know it's going to be bad. But guess what their next event actually is? The day of the Lord. What's that? The day the Lord says, come up the year. I'm going to talk to you for a little bit. Imagine what he says to them. Gird up your loins. We got some time. They're not going to be girding their loins. They're going to be wanting rocks to fall on. Why? Because the terrible day of the Lord's come for them. Uh, amen. It's a point on the man. What? That's the day, of their, the day of the Lord for them people if you pass. Same with us. Okay? Uh, let's go over to Zephaniah again. And let's go to chapter um, 3. Chapter 2. It's a, a day of judgment. <laughs> what is the, the day of judgment? Uh, the day of the Lord has come. Look this in uh, verse number, start in Zephaniah chapter 2 and look at verse number um, 2. It says, before the decree uh, bring forth, before the day pass as the shape, before the fierce anger of the Lord uh, come upon you. Before the day of the Lord's what? Anger. anger come upon you. Do what? Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his what? Judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's what? Anger. When the Lord comes back, you think he's happy? He's given you six. He's given man six thousand years to get right. Do you realize that? And guess what he did? Didn't happen. Six thousand years couldn't even get right. Amen. Uh, go over to uh, Romans uh, chapter two. Romans chapter two. It's a day of judgment. It's a day of anger. Romans chapter 2 and okay look at uh, verse number 4 because it's even in look he says oh despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance 
and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Don't you know this? Now watch, but after thy hardness and impudent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteousness, of the righteous judgment of God. The righteous judgment of God. That day of wrath and revelation when it's going to be revealed. He makes sure you understand what that day is. It's a day of judgment. Go to Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel. It's Ezekiel, then Daniel. After Jeremiah and Lamentation. Ezekiel 36. Look at verse number 18. It says, Wherefore I poured out my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their what? Idols wherewith they had polluted it. You know, when the Lord comes back, what do you think people are going to be looking toward? Idols. They're, you say, oh, how can they not see? They don't see today, do they? I mean, with all the grace that's been given out, with all the blessings that have been given, you'd think people would dump their idols, smash them apart, and, uh, and that's it. Well, I saw a house was just bought just down the road from me. So I'm riding on by and what do you think's out front immediately when the person got into their house? There stands some guy with a bald, with a, some monk or something with a bald head or whatever in front of some little half a toilet bowl, a half a toilet or something like that, whatever it is they do, a tub, and uh, making it like it's a religious object. What did they did? They got an idol. What's the first thing they put at their house? An idol. You think with God's grace and everything they've been provided, even a house, that they'd understand where it comes from, the blessing. Shameful. What? They don't know any better. Just ignorance. Go to the last last verse for this verse, the last of the day. Uh, go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is about to start. For real. tells you, and he says, look at verse 21, when he's talking about what's going to happen, and he says, for then shall be great tribulation. You're going to have big time tribulation. Such as was not since the beginning of the world uh, to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, Israel, Jesus Christ is a land. He says the sake those days shall be shortened. Amen. It's a good thing we have a grace. We have grace, and it's a good thing God's merciful even to His people. We're not going to be there at that time, so don't worry about it. Look at back in Joel chapter one. The day of the Lord's coming. It's a terrible day for you. Uh, call Psalm assembly. This is your remedy. Look what he says, verse sixteen. Is not the meat cut off before your eyes? Now, you notice what he's saying? He's saying what was up above. He told you the meat offering is gone and the drink offering is gone. What's that? You have no fellowship with the Lord and you have no joy. Now look at 16. goes right upon it. He says, is not the meat cut off before our eyes? Yay. You better under you. Hey, look, I'm going to say yay. What's that? Shake your head. It is. Agree with it. It's gone. Yay. Joy and gladness from the house of our God. You got no Bible? Guess what you got? You got no fellowship with God. No Bible, no fellowship. Look at verse 17, and you know what happened? Know what, know what was going under? The seed is what? Rotten. Rotten. Now, if we remember, 
back at the parable of the sower and the seed, he says, the seed is what? The word of God. The seed is the word of God, he says. So the seed is what? It's rotten. The seed's rotten. Did you notice how it's just, it says it's rotten from under the clods, the garners are, are laid desolate, the barns are, are broken down, and the corn is, uh, is withered. Uh, the places God set up, you know what happened? They got broken down from these places. Why? The seed is rotten. It's rotten. What was the most important part of that whole verse? The seed. And because that seed is rotten and under, under like that, guess what? The gardeners are good. The gardeners, they're gone. They're gone. Don't need it. The seed's rotten. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a good seed anymore. It's not going to be growing anything anymore. The fruit is gone from it that it would have produced. He, he says, it's gone. It's done. It's cut off. The seed is rotten. Uh, verse 18. How do the beasts groan? How do the beasts groan? Uh, it's an exclamation point. So he says, the beasts are groaning. Uh, what's that? The beast of burden. The oxes like that. The beast of burden. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are, are perplexed. Why is that? Because they have no pasture. They, they can't rest in the Word. The seed is rotten. You can't rest on those things. Hey, you say, go get an NIV and find out. Go read it. And, and I'll tell you another thing. Rest on the Scriptures. When I say rest on the Scriptures, rest on them. You'll be, you'll be wrestling all night with them. But the one thing you won't have is you won't have that meditation on the Word of God. Why? The seed's gone. The seed's rotten. The seed is rotten. It's corrupted. The beast grown, the beast of bird, they won't work anymore. The cattle, you know what they are? They're perplexed. Why? Not good instruction. Uh, they have no pasture. They don't have good fields to eat off of. Now look at the next word. He says what? Yay. You, you know, that's a word to keep the... To, to, Manipulate somebody that's in the agreeing with you when they do that. Yay, that's what the devil used. Yay, I've got said. Okay? Yay. What's that? He, but he's not doing it. You know what he's saying? He's he's giving you a, a he's gonna get it on top of each other, and the reason why, Miss Wanda, you don't have a chance to disagree. He's gonna get fact after fact. Yeah, that's going too. Yeah, that's going too. You know why? Because you have a tendency to try and grab on and hold on to things and say, This is oh no, no, no. We still got it. No, you can't see it. That's what the problem is. You can't see it. it's all going away. Amen. Amen. He says, the, Yea, the flocks of sheep, they're made desolate. They're made desolate. They are made desolate. The flocks, uh, uh, they're desolate. What's that? There's, no, there's nothing about them. They're not the same anymore. It can happen, people. It's happened before. It can happen again. But I always say it's like this. The best thing you can have is quality, not quantity. And the reason why is because the better the quality, the more you learn, the more you, you love, the more love you have for the Lord. Your love for that book has changed. Has changed. You don't see God the same as you, you saw him before in religion. You see them differently. The reason why is now that you can be intimate with them. And I'm not talking funny intimate. I'm talking real intimate with them. The intimacy you have with parents, you can have with the Lord. Amen. Verse number 19. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, to Thee will I cry. For the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. And the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. Now, the big thing on that verse is like this. You have to have the, the realization of things. You, you have to come to a realization of only God can cure this problem. Right. It, don't look at Brother Larry and I. We can't, we can't cure the problem. We can't cure the problem of getting joy back in the house. Right. We can only do one thing, and that is bring back the right seed, bring back the right book, and we can bring back the right songs. 
But it's time to lament. And it's time to ask God to put his blessing upon those things. Okay? Uh, there are there are uh, there are churches that actually have a King James Bible in them. They read from the King James Bible, and they're still dead. Even though it's the seed, guess what? Sometimes the seed is still corrupted. Why is that? Well, you've got a guy that doesn't believe the Bible that he preaches at. You ever have one of them? He has a King James Bible but doesn't believe it. What's that? He believes in some kind of hokey-dokey thing, like some originals or something in the background of it, and he says, I believe in that. Well, they're non-existent, so you're believing something that doesn't exist, and so what do you got? you got a fake seed. Amen. So, he says, O oh Lord, to thee will I cry, because only God can solve this problem. And, uh, and he says, For the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Okay? They devoured the pastures of the... Look, the Lord don't want... He doesn't want them, obviously, in the pasture of, of the wilderness. That's the pasture. Look, he doesn't need you. You're in the wilderness. Why? It's not bad to be in the wilderness all the time. But look, that's until you get the word. And then you need to come out of the wilderness. You don't need to be in the pastures of the wilderness. They're not the right places. You, you need to be in the pastures of the Lord. Pastures of the will. The pastures of the wilderness. They will. They they can feed you, but not the right stuff. You need to be with the pasture of the Lord. That's what He's looking at. Only God can help you, and you're in the wrong pasture. Amen. And you'll notice that next part. He says, "And the flame hath burned." What? All the trees of the field. Now, the field is the world, right? He told you the field is the world in his parables. Okay, so the trees. Who are the trees? Now, trees can be a lot of things. But he made sure there was a part of trees in the wilderness. The trees that uh, you see, it's, uh, one of the things that God gets is blind. He spits in his face. Jesus spits in his face. And he says, what do you see? And you know what the guy said he saw? He saw uh, men. As trees walking. See, when you first got saved, you start to look at the men who preach the gospel, and you start to look at them and you say, that guy's a good guy. And just so you know, he can't stay with you. Well, I, 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 you don't know. I, well, there's this preacher, and there's this preacher. Oh, they're just good. Look, they're just men. They're just men. Get your eyes off the preacher. Get your eyes on the preaching. Right. Off the preacher, on the preaching. Get your ears on it. He says, the, they're burned. All the trees of the field are burned. Let's go to Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel 22, look at uh, verse 17. Ezekiel 22, verse number 17. It says, and, and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, the house of Israel is to me become dross. All they are brass and tin and iron and lead in the midst of the furnace. The furnace is judgment. They are even the dross of silver. The silver is the good stuff. That's the redemptive quality. He says, you're just dross of that. You're just a waste product. Okay? He says, um, even that, you're dross. Uh, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because ye are all become dross, behold, therefore, I, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem. As they gather silver and brass and iron and lead and tin into the midst of of the furnace uh, to blow the fire upon it to melt it so will I gather you in mine anger and in my fury and I will leave you there and melt you yea I will gather you and blow upon you in the fire of my wrath and ye shall be melted in the midst thereof as the silver is melted in the midst of the fire excuse me furnace so shall ye be melted in the midst thereof and ye shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury 
upon you. You won't save yourself with him. Amen. 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 That was a good depiction of what's going on. The past of your wilderness and the flame hath burned all the trees in the field. They're no good anymore. You see, uh, the day that that day is 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 a, is a is a massive day. Look at verse twenty, the last verse. He says, "The beast of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of waters they're dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness." Um, say it like this: The church is going to be brought down. We're out of here, and there's not going to be any church. But there's going to be still some people. Uh, uh, I know some people that think that we're going through the tribulation. And they, the reason why they think we are is they think that, well, you know, the people here, they're going to need us. I, 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 God don't need you. You have to understand that. God don't need you. He wants you, but he doesn't need you. If the whole universe wasn't to be here, nothing was ever created, he's still God. And we must get that into our heads that we're not that important and we're not the important ones. Okay? Uh, the church will be, as I said, the church is going down and the church is going down because the church has been given to the people. The people are now making the decisions and it is going fast. It's going fastly down. We're just basically gathering on the parts and trying to float above water and to get people in. But you have to realize something uh, what he's trying to show you in this is the people are going to decide uh, what book they're going to use. Not God. When they get rid of that book and they bring another book in, God didn't do it. People bring it in. Okay? We pray in this church. You know what our prayer actually is? In Thessalonians he says, you need to pray that wicked men stay out. Amen. But we want them to get saved. I gotta tell you, most of them guys are saved. And they're wicked. And they come in through that door and they come in. And they come in and they come in soft. And you know what they try to do? They see that book in your hand and they just look at it and they don't they have good intentions. You know what they, they're thinking inside? Well, I can tell them how to get light upon that. How's that? Well, if they just know a few Greek words. They're going to get light upon that book. No, you're just going to learn some Greek words. And usually what I found with these guys is, they're Greek stinks. They had a whole half a semester. But most of the guys that are going to come in here have no experience whatsoever, even with it. And they come in, and they're only going to tell you what someone else has told you. Okay. Um... We'll be done in a few minutes. All right. He says, um, but the people are going to decide. But you know what else the people decide? They always decide what music they're going to use. There's God's music and then there's junk. Okay? I always said, you know, even when I was unsaved, and people used to say, how can I make you scream? I'd say, play rap music. <laughs> I was unsaved and I said it. Why? Man, that stuff is torture. Or there's the angry music. What's that? That's that music that just makes you want to pound your head into a, a wall. Okay? They bring that into the church house, and the church house is brought down by it. It's dried up and devoured by the pastures of the wilderness. God's setting up uh, number two when he starts the proclamation now. He, he told you what was happening. He told you about the plague. Now he's going to give you the proclamation about it. Okay? That starts chapter two. Let's pray. Father,